So uh, thanks, Atif, for inviting me to this conference and Adrian for moderating. Um, and I'd also like to thank Pallavi and Nancy for the administrative uh, back uh, back up for this conference. I'm sure that was considerable. Um, so broadly speaking, this panel is kind of discussing the reasons why international capital flows can sometimes result in perverse effects. Um, and Atif and Adrian asked me to speak about whether it would be possible to have a better international organizational structure when it actually came to default. Um, so I thought I would focus my brief remarks on sort of three issues um, that I think are worth addressing in this broad range of topics, both the specific topic I'm addressing and also the panel more generally. Um, first, uh, you know, following up on, on my, uh, my co-panelists, um, some of the reasons behind perverse capital flows. And what I'd like to focus on um, is uh, thinking about how sovereign state borrowing can interact with misaligned incentives shaped by corruption, particularly in the fragile states that are the focus of this conference, um, in particular because it can result in overborrowing, and it can also undermine the political will, the political will to actually address, uh, address the problems when it actually comes to default. Um, then I'll talk briefly about how this sheds light on some of the pragmatic questions of who should actually lead the way in improving the current international architecture. Um, and finally, I want to speak a bit about how the international legal architecture uh, might better address the current problems associated with state defaults, both ex ante um, and also ex post. Um, so first, on the issue of sovereign debt corruption and the practical problem of misaligned incentives. Um, I'm actually going to start with a true story. Um, a historical anecdote from the 1300s. Um, and at that time, of course, there was less of a difference between a country or state and an individual ruler, a king or a queen, um, that was supposed to be in charge of that state. Both of them were considered sovereign, right? So they're both sovereign. Um, my anecdote takes place during the Hundred Years' War when King Edward III of England arrived in Flanders for a military adventure. Um, but he ran out of money, as so many sovereigns do when they embark upon military adventures. And so he decided to borrow money from from the creditors um, that were on the continent. And they, as so many creditors do, asked for collateral, right? If in the event that you don't pay the money back, can we see something? Um, as is the case with uh, some sovereign debt today and seemingly increasingly amounts of sovereign debt today. Um, so Edward did not offer export commodities, which is more common today. Instead, he offered his personal valuables, um, his and his wife's jewels, their crowns, uh, his grandfather Edward I's great crown. Um, and when he was unable to pay, the creditors came to collect. Um, as part of this debt collection, they did seize this very personal collateral. They seized his jewelry. Um, they seized the great crown. They also took hostage several relatives who had personally guaranteed the loans. Uh, one cousin apparently was kept hostage for three months, so personal guarantee meant something else back in the day. Um, so this is an interesting and kind of fun story, but what is worth noticing here? What I want to emphasize is that the benefits and the risks of sovereign borrowing were joined together. Right? A family might enrich itself with sovereign funds, including with borrowed sovereign funds. After all, these were the sovereign's funds. But those personal riches were also personally at risk if things went wrong. Creditors would come after you personally. Right? So the risks and the benefits of access to sovereign power and access to sovereign wealth were combined. More recently, it seems that this risk and reward can sometimes be disconnected. Right? In some cases, um, it might be possible for elites to enrich themselves with sovereign wealth, including borrowed sovereign wealth, um, through corruption, right? in particular in states that have a uh, you know, higher degree of this difficulty. But the norms of private wealth, the use of tax havens, which has been talked about, um, and the norms and sort of rules surrounding private client banking mean that many of these elites are largely insulated from the risks of a sovereign debt problem, including sovereign default, if that actually happens. Um, it has proven difficult to access those funds, right, um, despite efforts through things like the World Bank's um, Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative. Um, I actually discuss some of these dynamics in a forthcoming paper that also looks at how uh, certain cases of vulture fund litigation have in some situations actually merged this sort of risk.